Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Grittiest Take as we are here to explore the Philadelphia Flyers in the new era, the Tortorella era, where we're going to talk about John Tortorella's press conference committing to a power play coach, which is a huge key with John Tortorella because I know Jason Martinez made the huge key of that hasn't always been a strong suit with John Tortorella's teams, but the penalty kill always is. So him committing to that is a huge um, plus, I would say, on top of every other plus that comes with John Tortorella. But first and foremost, gentlemen, before we get into it, how are you both doing today? I'm doing fine. It's nice summer off, you know, just relaxing and knowing it's going to be a big summer for the Flyers. I mean, this is just the first move uh, we're going to talk about here today, but there's a lot to happen. We've got a draft with a very high pick coming up, and then uh, we've got, I'm sure, some player moves and, uh, you know, and hopefully some good news on Ryan Ellis and his health as he is uh, rehabbing. So uh, yeah, it is a big, big summer here for the Flyers, and, and now it's underway. Steel? Oh, man, I'll tell you what, I'm doing great because anytime I get a chance to sit down with, with Jim and, and the professor to talk Flyers hockey, what? Sign me up. I'm there. Pick me. Um, enjoying the summer. I dinner for about an hour. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, though. I've been really enjoying the uh, Stanley Cup finals um, and the, the playoffs. I've really been enjoying the playoffs as well, too. It's really great. Even this is my favorite. Game. Huh? Even that touchdown game? Either touchdown, <laughs> yep. Um, this is my favorite time of the year. This is like Christmas again because this is when you get to watch some of the best hockey in the planet. You get to see the best teams play against the best teams, right? And they're all playing for one thing, and that is the chalice, okay? So I, I don't care. This is my favorite time of the year. I got Formula One racing. I got football getting ready to start up here at the end of July. I got hockey all season going on. I got Stanley Cup finals. What? Best time of the year. Right. Well, my the dad's also going to be in the golf. I the Red Hot Phillies, too. And Come the on. Phillies. And the yeah. Phillies. Come on. But I'll tell you what, I, as you know, used to be very busy in the summertime with those Phillies. And the last two summers, I have not, um, which actually I've enjoyed, first of all. But more to the point, it's given me a chance to watch the playoffs. I've never, outside of when the Flyers are in the playoffs, quite obviously, uh, that, that I'm involved then. But once the Flyers have been eliminated over the last 14 years until last summer, uh, I switch my attention completely fully to baseball. So right. I never really got a chance to sit back and just watch the rest of the playoffs. Oh, wow. Last two, last two years I've been able to do it. Last year was good, but still the Canadian division didn't have fans. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't quite as good. This year was just off the charts. I mean, I was lucky enough to call a couple of games for TNT as well. But but actually just watching, sitting and watching the games has been just – it's been off the charts good. I mean, the, the first couple rounds, the first round in particular actually is the, the best to me. Because all these 16 teams come out. And they are ready to roll. I mean, and, everybody's uh, here. The yeah. It's crazy. But the second round had some craziness, too, with Edmonton and Calgary and some of the uh, other series. Uh, so, um, and, and then I think by the conference finals, now it's it's just real important every game because obviously you're talking about the final four. Um, I'm not sure the intensity is quite the same because the guys are, our teams are a little worn down now once you get to that third series, but it's still awesome. And now the finals, it's all up for grabs. And we're seeing a, a Colorado team just firing on all cylinders right now. It'll be very interesting to see if Tampa can get back into the series. But the bottom line is, it has been great. I agree with you, Steele. It's been um, a lot of fun to just watch it. And I, I, you know, I put some money down on other sports, like NBA. I can't really with hockey, but NBA and, and baseball and all that. But I watched the NBA playoffs. For that reason, I have a vested interest. It's not close. It's just the intensity is not close. The, it's, nope. it's all about fouls and drawing fouls and flopping and unfortunately the NBA is getting a little bit like soccer in regards to all the acting that goes on and you know it takes 25 minutes to play the last two and a half minutes of the game and I mean it's, it's just <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good issue. don't get me wrong it's sport it's great unbelievable athletes to watch Steph Curry I mean I'm a huge fan of his and to watch him win another championship was was amazing but then I flip over and I watch th these guys blocking shots bleeding all over the place broken bones sprained ankles they're playing through it all um and all the storylines and i mean it, it's just been great yeah well for the playoffs i mean you look at how banged up speaking of uh the oil like the teams in the play the oilers were probably one of the more banged up teams. you had leon dreisettle playing with basically one foot and still putting up 
the second most points on his team. So that just goes to show how much of a freak of nature that likely is going to lead to a day in the Hall of Fame at the end of his career he'll be at the time. So I, if, if things keep progressing this way, and he'll probably eventually move from Edmonton if all hell breaks loose there and they can't win in the next five to seven years. So I think he'll put up the good enough stats and eventually get a Stanley Cup. But well, on you, top you, of you brought up Edmonton, so I because I know it was on this podcast where I went on my Connor McDavid rant, I believe, and I think, or no, I'm sorry, it might have been Steele's podcast, but uh, just the same, it was the same company. We it was the three of us, and I might have been four people, but it, yeah. you two were definitely there, and I know Ryan, you were there. I went on the Connor McDavid rant saying, "What has he done in the playoffs?" Well, he, he clearly put that to bed this year. He finally got that will to go with the skill. He was absolutely phenomenal and, and didn't have much to do with them losing. Although, if you watch closely, Colorado did a really good job on him. He got his points, but he wasn't clearly as dominant in that series as he had been against Calgary he, or even late. He, in he the had Boston. to fight. He had to fight for every ounce he of ice he got. And he learned And that. that's what made it better, Jim, I think. Yeah. I, mean, I agree with you 100%. That, yeah. I think he answered the naysayers exactly with what your point was right there, Jim, because he answered the bell. And he it fought did. through it. But what my question, though, is it didn't take Sidney Crosby seven years to do that. Sidney Crosby was in the mode that we saw Connor McDavid in in year two, the first year they made the playoffs un- with him. In. He was unbelievable. If you watch Con- uh, uh, Sidney Crosby from day one on the ice, we saw him in his very first game in Philadelphia with the Darian Hatcher situation. Yeah. How much <laughs> he wanted to win. He would do anything to try to win. To the point where he sometimes ticked the rest of us off with his, you know, the whining and the head flopping back. He kind of he matured through that. But the one thing is, he always had that will. I would say he is the outlier, though, because if you look at Mario Lemieux, took about that long to really explode and win a cup. Steve Eisenman, same thing. Mike Madonna. A lot of these great players were great offensive players, but they didn't figure it out that you got to play the other end and you got to have that will to try to drag your team to victory until middle of their careers. But I will say that about, I know Philadelphia, people hate Sidney Crosby. He had it day one. That is what yeah. I think sets him apart. Not that he's better than any of these other players, although I think he is, but he did have that will right from the beginning, whereas it took some of them well into their careers to get it. Some I think players. it takes the mental maturity. If you have like, if your mental maturity is well above your age, then you're going to have that much younger. And Crosby seemed to come into the league with, and I also found myself in the last calendar year complimenting Cindy Crosby a lot more than I would ever. Th- but, but anyway. Uh, well, nobody, Cros- nobody, I don't know if Flyers Cros- fan wants Cros- to. Crosby's I, been very good. I get good. killed if I give any yeah. positive Sidney Crosby Crosby's been on the air. Yeah. But the He's- bottom line is the guy's been a spectacular player and a great ambassador for the sport. So, uh, you know, that there's no way we can get around that fact. You know, no. he's been our nemesis. There's no doubt about it. But he also he had, is a guy. But let me say, did. my final point on McDavid is the league will have to deal with this monster. Now that he is to that point where he has the will, he obviously has always had the skill. Barring injury, he's almost unstoppable. The only thing that stopped him really this time around was dry settle getting hurt, Smith leaking. And, you know, Darnell Nurse was playing. They, they, As you said, they were really beat up. But they are poised, if they don't screw it up, they are poised to win multiple cups. Because when he has that will and that skill, you saw it late in the L.A. series, early in the Calgary series, most most of the Calgary series, he's just about unstoppable. So, uh, I mean, that is scary because next year he'll be 26 uh, you know, middle-aged in hockey years, but in his prime, his absolute prime. Will he be stoppable? I'm not sure. If they get even a competent goalie, if they don't get all banged up in their key players, I got to think they're going to win a cup here pretty soon. Um, so that's that's the bad. I mean, bad news for the rest of the NHL is that, that that you know Connor's finally I think figured that out, and I say finally in a way that maybe it took a lot of players that long to figure it out, but but. Uh, you know, he's been called the best player on the planet way too early, in my opinion. This, this is what we used to talk about. I mean, he was the best offensive player. OK, you can maybe say that he was the most exciting player. You could say that he was the best highlight. You could say that. But he was not the best all around player in the world. No, until maybe this year because maybe. he didn't play yeah. in his own zone. He didn't play game. In the 200 yeah. foot game. And he didn't have that will. I mean, he wilted in the playoffs last year. He, he flat out wilted. He watched he it. Swept. So, but now what we saw this year 
was a completely different animal. And if he is that now, I don't know how you're going to beat that team if they don't get banged up or don't have all kinds of things go against them because he's that good. And so is Dreisaitl if Dreisaitl's healthy. So yeah, that, well, Dreisaitl, a- Dreisaitl to me always reminded me of, because one of my favorite players to watch growing up was Kopitar, which is still one of my favorite players to watch. Today. But uh, he was obviously a little bit quicker like Dre is now when he was younger than he is at 35 or whatever Anzi Kopitar is at right now. But uh, he kind of, the way that I think Dreisaitl is a much more offensive version of Kopitar, but also almost has the defensive qualities of Anzi Kopitar, which is a crazy thing to have that offense when your defense is also that good. So I always, he was always the guy that was my favorite person on Edmonton, actually, as a player, because I'm a big, I want you to be good in both ends. That's why I was, I always loved watching Ovechkin. He was exciting, but I never loved Alexander Ovechkin as an overall player until Barry Trotz coached Washington. He, he's another so, guy. That was going to, what I was going to bring up was Ovechkin. Yeah, he, he did not win up, a cup so until he played the 200 foot game. Yeah. What? Took, yeah, exactly. Took, and McDavid committed to that. In the middle of his <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, McDavid committed to that this year, and I think – I'm not the biggest analytics person, but I think analytics are better for defense sometimes to realize underlining stuff than offense because offense you can kind of see more with your naked eye a lot easier or defense. You have to really analyze everything to see it with your naked eye, which I don't think the regular just run-of-the-mill fans necessarily do that. So the analytics show pretty good on defense, where McDavid's defense upticked drastically this year. compared to. So I agree yeah, his, with what Jim was his, saying his on that. His numbers and, and his – and his analytics were much, much greater uh, in the plus side this year than they were last year. Yeah, and even yeah. across the, numbers, the board, guys, it's just you watched him. You you watch. Yeah. Uh, the way he celebrated goals, silly thing, right? Not necessarily because for for years he was just like, does he even enjoy playing the game? I, I wasn't even sure, but he had so much passion behind yeah. everything he did, um, and that obviously showed in his defensive play, but it also showed. It, it, it's it's a hard to measure thing that that leadership that Mark Messier uh, ability that you you might have that ability to pick a team up and carry it it's so hard to, to measure it um, but I think it it was it was obvious with him this year it, it, it's obvious by his reactions it's obvious by when they needed a play he came up with a play for the most part uh, so uh, now that that's unlocked within him I don't think it's going away and um, I, I just think they're going to be a, a, a tough, tough bunch to handle uh, from here on for the next three or four or five years until he's. I think it's going to be them outside. in Colorado in the West. If they get a competent goal, yeah. we like you said, it's going to be yeah. them and the Avalanche kind yeah. of just battling that thing and, out. And, and I think you got to throw Calgary in there too, because to be quite honest with you, depending on the moves, yeah, yeah, yeah they got uh, a lot on their plate. I, and I don't, they have to re-sign some folks, but I don't. I think they're going to lose a player, but I don't think it's going to be Johnny, but. That's just my opinion, but I, I know Monahan. I agree, though. Yeah. Yeah, Monahan's not even a... a it, it's, I, I like Edmonton. They can't, they can't probably keep both Kachuk and Gaudreau. Long-term. Right. One of them's going to have to go. One more year, but long-term, uh, and, you know, I just don't see that team needs both of them right now. So, right. Uh, but they have a great coach, so I don't think... Uh, they have, yeah. Although I mean, he didn't look in the playoffs, they have a great goalie. So, I mean... That's they have the foundation there already. Exactly, who's one of them? But I don't know if I'd put them steal up with with uh, Colorado and what Edmonton could be next year. Uh, Los Angeles is another team. They're young. They're coming on. I don't know. Kopitar is getting old. It's a weird dynamic there. They're losing Dustin Brown and Kopitar. Right. And Dowdy's getting older, but right. a whole bunch of young talent. It's going to be interesting. All, all the conferences. And the I agree. Got teams like Pittsburgh <laughs> and Washington that should be dropping off, and you know, hopefully they just haven't. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, right. they they did. They they showed signs this year of cracking at at various times during the year. But great coaching went a long way in in, in terms of Pittsburgh's. I was case. just gonna say Pittsburgh the same deal. Yeah, and Washington. They both also have tricky goaltending situations. So I mm-hmm. mean, it, it it's uh, it's gonna be interesting to see all over the place as we we settle in. And <laughs> you know, the year hasn't even ended yet, but the season. Right. I mean, my gosh. But I think we're going to see some shifts in the in the conferences here pretty soon. I agree. I agree because the New York, look at what New York has done yes. um, this this past say. season, and we've obviously seen clearly that Boston has fallen what fallen away um, a little bit as well too. I believe they're going to have some pieces and parts they're going to have to redo uh, this year as well too in Boston, and depending yes. on how things go this year with Tampa Bay, if Tampa Bay loses. 
I think you're going to see more of that team being, you know, just just broken up just because. Yeah, the only thing is they're still, they're pretty well set. With their oh, they are? Long term. I mean, they, okay. they don't have anybody coming up, do they? I, I don't think any of their main I, I'm players I'm not sure what they, you always lose a couple of guys. Tampa's prospect year. pool is always creating the next but Alex right. Kalor and the next Ross yeah. Colton, which, which is why they're such an impressive team because right. and they, they also don't have these. Players. Yeah, yeah, but they don't right. always have the brouhaha prospects, and then they turn them into right. something which is right. more impressive. Right. Which is a more impressive skill to me than a team that has brouhaha and he becomes great because it's kind of expected. I think it's Andre nice. Palat, right? Palat's yeah. the only guy they lose this year. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, they end and up that's, losing that's him. not a small loss. He's he's one of those key secondary players for them. But but like Hedman, Kucherov, Stamkos, Vasilevsky. I mean, as long as that key is there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's okay. a pretty good core. Holding another young core. Yeah, I'll and, say and that's a great head coach too. Great head coach. That's a pretty good core, I'd have to say. Yeah, by the way, yeah. but you know, that's not what we're here to talk about, right? No, we're, we also I, talked fifty we, minutes. We on talked about Stanley everything, Cup and but every other team, every other team, <laughs> uh, but the, but the, but the, but the, the uh, <laughs> So, um, before, so the first thing I was going to go into now that we got to uh, the Flyers is. Steel, I'll let you go first for this one. First and foremost, when it comes, we'll start with the draft and then we'll go to to Rowe because I think the draft might even change a little bit now that you got a coach and you kind of know what your structure is going to be a little bit more than just all these mock drafts that have like 85 different people for the Flyers, which I don't really typically look at the mock drafts. I look at more who's projected by the rankings to be at five. But for you, would you keep the fifth overall pick, trade it, and if you're going to keep it, who would be the main guy that you would select that you think is still going to be there at five? Oh, wow. Okay, so to be honest with you, I think in the draft, I I think it would not necessarily be a bad deal for um, the Flyers to... Jim's camera went away. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hold on. Keep talking, still. That's ahead. okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, w- I wouldn't. I don't think it would be a bad idea for them to actually trade back. Am I back? Yep. yep we got you. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, I wouldn't think it would be a bad idea for them to trade back, like to try to garner more picks. So maybe not necessarily. Yeah, to try to get a second round or you know something from like you might want to contact like. Um, LA or maybe Anaheim, they might have a potential prospect that we could grab or something that we could do, some kind of a trade that we could okay, get. Okay, so you're, wait, wait, so you're talking about a prospect and a second round pick then for or first. just a second round pick, whatever. Just we're uh, not necessarily. We're not going to trade the fifth overall pick to first. What I'm trying to say is we're trading the fifth overall pick to <laughs> that was the back. Those are the end of Steel's GM days right there. Yeah, right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> So no, you you take the, uh, the the fifth overall pick and you trade back to like where Anaheim and or L.A. is, and you, they're nine, ten, eleven, something like that. You know what I mean? Anaheim's to me- ten. Uh, I don't know where the heck L.A. is. LA, San Jose. L.A.'s down. L.A.'s nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think you were thinking of San Jose because San Jose's eleven. Anaheim's ten. San Jose's. 11. No. No. Either. Either. Either L.A. or Anaheim, either one of those two teams, I think you could trade back because I think they have multiple first-round picks that you could trade to get for one of them. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to say basically is this. I would trade the fifth overall pick to move back in the first round to try to garner a second-round pick. Try to get a first and a second. Then that would probably be more likely with L.A. because I don't think you're going to get the 10th and a second-round pick. For the fifth. That's just my own opinion. Well, but. I think what the Flyers would need to do then is add a player into that mix that would maybe help sweeten that deal or whatever the case is. Yeah. I mean, I mean right I now. Don't know. I, I, there's so many different scenarios. There's so many different things. I, I like Savoy as as one of the kids coming out. Um, I really like him. I, I like this Gaither guy, and he's not a bad choice either. Um, either one of those two would be fine selections as far as I'm concerned, but I think there's some other players that might potentially be available later in the first round, and it might behoove the Flyers to trade a first-round pick to get 
a later first round pick. So move back from the well, fifth. If they go to where you're at, I would say the picks, when you look at the um, rankings, and somebody I remember I tweeted about a couple of days ago because I like him, Owen Pickering, the one defenseman, could potentially be there. He's a big defenseman. Seems like a defenseman John Tortorella would get catch a man crush on pretty quickly for his compete yeah, level you know, and how he played. I mean, so draft, I feel like he would fit in fairly well. There's other guys like Nathan Kosher, um, I think I said his name right. Mirachenko would probably be there at 19 if you want to take yeah. the risk on him, but are the Flyers going to be a team that wants to take a risk? Uh, McGrody, if you want a goal scorer, is probably still going to be there, the USHL guy. So there's a couple guys. I would say that would be the clay, like that would be – probably the types of guys you would get. Overall, though, overall, I don't think this draft is going to produce a crop of players. You're going to get good starting NHL players in this draft, as far as I'm, as far as my opinion is. I think you're going to see a lot of good starting NHL players in this draft. I don't think we're going to see a generational player. I don't think we're going to see superstar players, quote unquote. But I think we're going to see really good starting players in this draft. I think we're going to see better draft more of the generational type players in, in the following two drafts after that. So in my opinion, I think we can move back from the fifth overall pick or we can try to pick, you know, one of those types of players to try to get a second round pick. That's kind of what I would be thinking with the fifth round of the fifth overall. Fifth pick. overall. See, well, maybe, I, I, I mean, the yeah, fifth overall yeah. pick is um, even in a draft where you may not have the obvious generational player i hate that term i um, know yeah i don't like that the bottom either. line is we don't know We're right not gonna know kale mccarr is a generational player that three teams including the flyers yeah, did not one. yeah. no one it, i i you know i love the i love the the uh what is it uh, they call it when you judge something in the past the you know, you criticize something. Uh, hindsight, like 2020 or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, 2020 like hindsight. Uh, yeah. I love that now because I remember that draft clearly. And from a public standpoint, and I do know there was a real push in the Flyers organization to take not, not Kale McCarr, Miro Haskinen. He was the guy. Mm -hmm. who yeah. Pushed for. But publicly, it was either Heeshear or Patrick. And in fact, it was up until halfway through their last year, it was absolutely Patrick number one, he's year two, he's year passed him perhaps when they got even and New Jersey decided to take he's year. So the Flyers took Patrick. There wasn't this whole talk. So we can sit here right now and I can say this name or that name. Cutter Gauthier is the guy I think would be a, a decent fit, might be a reach at five a little bit, but I think the Flyers need size up front. Yeah. Uh, he's not a bad mm -hmm. skater. I do. I do think that they need speed in their lineup as well, but, but he's not a bad skater, but his size, we're, they're small up front. They go out and sign a free agent like Johnny Gaudreau, but even if they don't, they're small up front. Um, they've got Couturier and Hayes with some size, um, but then you look besides that, there's a lot of small, smallish forwards, um, and if they add a, a Johnny Gaudreau through free agency, then obviously you're not adding any size there either, a lot of skill. So I, I think they might look for and I, and I know in talking with, with Chuck Fletcher and at the time Mike Yo. There was a concern about the size. I mean, Bobby Brink, another young player, is small. I mean, they, yeah. they have a, a lot of, of talented players, but they're not necessarily big players. So uh, I know that's why they really want Tyson Forster. To I was just going to say, he's like 6'2 uh, or 6'3. Yeah. Wade as but, well. They want Wade to stay healthy. <laughs> yeah. That well, be, Wade, yeah. Wade, is a, Wade at this point, in my opinion, is a bonus if it happens because he's had yeah. so many injuries. But I, I don't want to get into all that. I mean, all these, these prospects, we sit here and they're rated by the Hockey News and McKean's and – and the scout and you know the central scouting bureau and all these the, we don't know especially this year we've had less time to look at these kids because they lost a year and a half basically exactly but, yeah you know so this is more of a wild card draft so in saying that you know steel you might have a good point uh we don't really know so there, this is possible that a guy picked 22nd could be as good as a guy picked sixth in this year's draft we yeah there's more of a chance of that i'd say in this year's draft but we also don't know that one of these guys might not be a generational player. It's possible they could be. I have to trust. Brett Flair's uh, got a pretty good track record in terms of uh, analyzing it. talent. Yeah. And I, I got to see where, where they're going to go with this. But but uh, I wouldn't trade it unless they have a really, real good guy they know is going to be available, like, you know, 19th, 16th, wherever they trade to, um, that, that they know is going to be available. And only they know that. 
or they're getting a player, a current player in the trade that they feel is really going to help now. We know it's not about five years from now with this, with what, what Chuck Fletcher and Dave Scott have said. This is about a quick rebuild, which I think can definitely happen. I disagree with the naysayers. Oh, they're so far away. 06, 07, this, the team was worse than this year's team record-wise. The next year, they were in the conference finals. So don't give me this, it takes four or five years. It doesn't always take four or five years. The Rangers sent out letters talking about, give us four or five years. And two years later, they were content. <laughs> two years later, they were in the conference finals. So it, it's just not, it, we, it's not like it was 15, 20 years ago. With the salary cap, there's free agents that become available. Uh, players, it, it, there's just more movement. You can you can restructure a team pretty quickly. So, and I've got ideas. I think there's five things they need to have happen in this offseason. One of them has already happened. Hire a good coach. But I mean, they they they. I just think that this draft is is not one. I don't think that unless they know a guy's going to be there at 16, they're not making a trade. You can get a guy at five, grab him, and add another asset to the pile. They have a pretty good stockpile of young players here. I mean, Noah Cates is an absolute prospect. Now you ask anyone around the NHL after watching him play uh, last year, they all feel he is an absolute NHL player. I actually told maybe a top about nine, him at the maybe even a top six, <laughs> but definitely a top nine player. He could be a third line guy to go with Scotty Lawton and somebody else, you know, to, to, to fill out that lineup. Uh, and there's other, yeah, I mean, Brink, we don't know about yet. And Forster and Allison, of course, the injury risk there. Um, I, I think that Isaac Radcliffe has a, a possible role with the team there, there's there's younger players out there still and then of course defensively you've got cam york and and zamula who could could be guys that contribute right away i mean next year they could be the third pair i mean who knows um so you know we're, where we're at now is there are some good young players here there's also some good veterans uh, there's a good goalie in my opinion a guy you can build around there's now a, a coach that knows how to get a team to play the kind of way you have to play to win in the playoffs, to win to get to the playoffs, and then also win perhaps in the playoffs to get teams to sacrifice. So there's already some pieces starting to fall into place. But one of the five points of my plan is health. I mean, they cannot have 500 man games lost to injury next year. They cannot lose Sean Couturier and Ryan Ellis for almost the entire season and Kevin Hayes for a large chunk of it. That cannot happen. So they have to have some degree of health next year. And that's another piece of the puzzle. It's kind of up there for the hockey gods to, to deal with, but that they need. Um, they, they need the young players like Joel Farabee and some others to take another step. Absolutely. I mean, Travis Sanheim was one who did that last year. I think we saw some signs late in the year of Provorov playing pretty well, but I think if you give him Ryan Ellis, you'll see that happen with him. And, um, and then some of the younger players also that we were just talking about, Cates and some of those guys will have to take a bigger chunk of the team as well. Um, so that's another thing. So health, that, good coach, that's three of them. Um, and, and you know, you look at this team, and, I mean, I don't think if you just give them last year, Katuri Ellis and Hayes, that they missed the playoffs. They might, but they would have at least been in contention for it. I know a lot of the naysayers say they were so far away, those guys wouldn't have been anything. Well, no. Sean Couturier is one of the better two-way players in the NHL. Ryan Ellis is one of the better two-way defensemen in the NHL. You take those two players out of any lineup, it's really going to hurt. And then you add, oh, by the way, 400 of the man games lost to injury, uh, including Kevin Hayes, your second-line center for much of the year. I mean, he wasn't his first three iterations last year. That wasn't Kevin Hayes. You know, we didn't really see Kevin Hayes until he finally came back the last time. Right. Um, and so, so much, guys, was missing last year. So if those guys are back, it's already a much better team. And then you add, and who knows if this year's draft pick, probably not, but he might be ready. Um, but then you got some of these other young players coming in, and then they do have to tweak. They have to make a move to me to get a power play guy who can really turn it up. This is the element that might be the hardest to do. They're going to have to probably trade contract away, trade salary away, or buy out salary. But they are going to have to create some space to get a guy who can be a power play weapon. Now, he doesn't have to be the shooter because Cam Atkinson can be that guy. Maybe if Tyson Forster develops, he can be that guy. Maybe Wade Allison can be that guy. Maybe uh, uh, actually Owen Tippett. I'm out. I forget him. He could maybe be that guy. So they might have the gunner already. Maybe they need the playmaker because they don't have Claude Giroux anymore. Johnny Gaudreau would obviously fit into that realm. 
I don't know if Phil Forsberg will make it to free agency, but he's a power play weapon as well. So yep. whatever, maybe there's a guy out there they can get who's a power play weapon. They'll have to trade something to get that. Um, even if it's a free agent, they're going to have to trade salary. But they'll have to do something in there, I think, to upgrade the dynamic offensive ability of this team. So if they do all those things, and it's a lot, the health probably is the toughest one. But if they get all those, I have no question this team will be competing for a playoff spot next year. If they're healthy, if, uh, you know, the Ellis Couturiers never all back and they don't lose a whole bunch of other players, if they get a dynamic offensive player, if they get a good head coach, which I think they've already done, we haven't even talked about it yet, um, and if the young players move up. So it's really a four-point plan. If they get all that, I think this team's in the playoffs next year. If not, uh, they're very close. And and then in, in the NHL, as we all know more than any other sport, if you get in the playoffs, you've got a chance. So uh, we'll see from there. I mean, then it's a matter of those young players continuing to develop and then tweaking the roster further if you want to make another step. But I think next well, year playoffs would be a great goal to have, and I think it's 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 something they can do if if they're if they have a good summer. And I think they're off to a good start with John Tortorella. Well, I'm definitely in the camp of higher on obviously covering all three levels. Usually tends to lead me to be higher on our prospects than most of the general populace and get into Facebook arguments with most of the general populace. <laughs> but, the, the funny yeah. Joe, nobody totally. knows. Of oh, our prospects. We're all, we're, all, we're all projected. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's more, more just people go for the jugular on certain guys, and I'm like, well, I'm not letting you attack that guy like that. So, like, it's more... It's more when that happens that I'm going to go back at the person. If they just say something that's their opinion, that actually has value. Like, if you say a fifth-round pick is going to be a bust, you don't know what the hell you're talking about to me because it's a fifth-round pick, and a fifth-round pick doesn't yeah. qualify as a bust. <laughs> like, exactly. like, the first two rounds exactly. would qualify as a bust at most in hockey, probably. So, like, the where once you get to the third one, it's really a game of probability compared to the first couple, but... I'm in the camp of I would keep it because I'm upset the one guy that I love and Slavkovsky's got so good and is now not going to be there five. But it's all right. I'm over it at this point. Not really. But um, Juracek, I think, would be if we're going to go a defenseman because I feel like for a fact Seattle's going to take one of the two. And uh, so basically, if you want to go with a defenseman, Nemec or Juracek, they're both good. It's just the only thing that concerns me about Nemec is his skating. Uh, when you have smaller ice, is he going to be able to take it where obviously in Europe, uh, it's a little bit easier to take advantage of it because there's more openness to the ice because it's bigger where you're check is much better at skating. So that's why if I had to pick defense, I would favor him. But I think forward, it would have to be Savoy just because Savoy seems like, even though he's only five ten, out of like, yeah, I like him too. He's a center. Uh, where Kemmel, I think, is going to be a very good scorer, but is a winger. So I think it would be good to get a center that's very good on both ends. I, I also I just, like. I know the organization is not looking to add another small forward. So I, I know that there's a lot of prognostications about Savoy, but and I haven't talked to anybody, so this isn't inside knowledge. This is just I know from last year when we were talking about all the young players. It's like yeah, and then there was always how about a big forward. Maybe we can. Well, in that in that case, then Gauthier would probably be my top. Right. Yeah. I, I, and he said. came on. I mean, he had a great combine. I mean, he's he's um he's not slow either. I mean, usually yeah. when you're talking big forwards, you're talking guys at lumber. And and I I completely agree with the Charlie O'Connor's espoused this a lot that when you look at the top, however, twenty prospects the Flyers have, it's so weird that like in almost uh, I'd probably say. 75% of them, there's always that line, not the best skater, but. And <laughs> so I do think they do have to add speed. I understand that. But in Goche is not a weak skater. He's just, he's a big guy. And, um, you know, and I guess. He's a strider, I, mean, I, would I haven't say. seen him play personally. I've seen clips. Um, I, th- to me, this is such a crapshoot. We can sit here and talk about strengths and weaknesses of players. But I, I just think it's a, I mean, the scouts who have been out and seen him, it's not as much of a crapshoot. Um, but to see him on streaming, you know, one game in junior, one game in Europe, to me, I, it's, I mean, we all come up, we do this with the NFL draft. We come up with these opinions on these players, and three months later, you look silly half the time. Like, oh, my God. Like, everyone's, everyone's talking about um, the linebacker the Eagles picked out of Georgia, right? Dean? Nicole right? Dean. Yeah, Nicole yeah. Dean in the third. Uh, right. You know, and I'm not an Eagles fan. I wanted my team to pick him, but he went to the third round. So, 
they're, they're, the media around here is talking about him like he's like the first overall pick. There are <laughs> yeah. questions about this guy. He's undersized. And, and clearly injuries. he fell there. Yeah, yeah, the injuries. But the injuries allegedly weren't serious. But if they weren't serious, he wouldn't have fallen to third. So, I mean, we're building this guy way up there. And then we'll see halfway through the season if he's even on the roster. I mean, it's just that uh, we, we do this with prospects. We do this with draft picks in all sports now because there's so much out there, information out there, that I do it. I do it when it comes to football. I read and I say, oh, we got to get this guy. got to get this guy. And then I'm sitting there thinking to myself, why do I have to get this? I've never even seen the guy play. <laughs> scouting. Like scouting reports, you know? So uh, it's important not to overvalue them. You can't screw up the high picks. I mean, where would the Flyers be if they had Hayskin and, or McCarr right now? I mean, oh, my. We wouldn't be having this conversation about a fifth overall pick. I guarantee you that. No. Um, not this year. I mean, that, I mean, even in hockey, well, one player – can actually mean uh, uh, that much when you're talking those first five, six picks. I of also the think what Steele said earlier when it came to the, if we're going with a bigger guy, unless if you're getting um, at that point, Gauthier, you might as well probably at that point trade back because in a lot of the high rankings, a lot of those bigger skaters are in the teens. So I feel like if you trade back and do get assets, you're going to at least get someone like Geeky. If you trade to the 14. Say, See, that's kind of what that's uh, Winnipeg. So if you did a trade just because of the 14th pick, Winnipeg was the other one too. Yeah. Like geeky is somebody you could get there. Another yeah. guy would be, uh, I've heard it. Uh, the guy from uh, the US. Uh, Jimmy Camel. Did you mention Camel too? I think. Yeah. Camel. Camel. Yeah. Like six foot. Yeah. Think, isn't he exact? Six foot. So Camel's not really that big. Six or six one. They got to get something for the pick. I mean, they have to hope that somebody's really falling in love with somebody to really want that fifth pick. I mean, if you could actually get a, an actual player and drop back to the second round, or a player, and who cares about the second round pick? If you could actually get a decent young veteran player right now to plug into your lineup, even even as low as far as I'm concerned, you know, as the third line, I would think more you want a second line or better for for fifth overall, but. If you got a guy you know is going to be an everyday player for you, and you can get him, and he's ready right now, and he's not old, um, you know, I, I would, I would maybe do that because there's no, these are, there's no guarantees here. Now you might look silly. We might all look Mike Trout silly. There may be some guy out there that just takes off. I mean, it happens, um, you know. Uh, but hey, but you know, line right now, this team needs to turn it around pretty quickly. Yeah. If there's a player out there who's going to be a, a decent player for you, I mean, uh, you know, not a, not a. Uh, Right, fourth line guy or a third no, somebody that can come in and play right away. He might do that as well. So right, somebody but that I might just that come to there. mind is Kevin Fiala. I was just thinking of a name off of yeah. the top of my head. Right, yeah. but see, that's, he brings with him salary cap. But I mean, so you're going to have to get a guy. We were talking about before about power play guy. He, he could mm -hmm. he could help the power play. So. Right, which is why I mentioned in my trade, you're going to have to get a guy from like uh, an LA or an Anaheim or some or a Winnipeg that's going to be a prospect guy that's ready to play right now. You well, know, what you might do also or a young players player players like Seattle. Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Got a cap issue. A team that knows they're not going to have to pay the guy they pick with this pick for three years at any high rate, and like you can get a Fiala that way, or you can get a pretty good player because. You know, they aren't going to be able to afford him anyway, and now they're getting a fifth overall pick for him. So in their eyes, it's a, it's a home run for So them. that's why, right. So, so keep your eye out on, on something like that. It's possible. And the Flyers do need, as I said, as part of my plan, they need to add a dynamic offensive player. And Fiala but I think that would be a way for them to do that, Jim, would be for, a way for them to get that, to get a good player, maybe not necessarily – that where they have to move a lot of salary because to be quite honest with you, I don't think moving salary is going to happen this year. I just don't, unless they buy them out. And even then, if they buy them out, it's not really saving them, but $2 million. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Saving more yeah, than that, little, but it's like the, two points. I guess the cap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, that's... But, but yeah, a trade could happen still. If you're, if you're moving them, with picks, including right. the fifth overall pick, which right, uh, right, if if they feel they're going to go out and get Johnny Gaudreau, you have to put it. You have to think of it this way: if if Johnny Gaudreau is your target, and trading James Van Riemsdyk is going to get you Johnny Gaudreau, you might be willing to part with the fifth overall pick with James Van Riemsdyk in order to open up that cell. Now, is that an absolute home run for the team you trade with? Can it be a team in your division? Probably not. But if it's going to get you Johnny Gaudreau, 
Now, you have to have absolute certainty in that, but then you might do it because Johnny Gaudreau is worth the first round pick. But uh, that's, yes. you know, and John, James Van Reems like, has some value now, but he is now a veteran player who's, whose value does not meet his contract anymore. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. Chuck's going to have to be creative. There's no doubt yeah. about it. But he's I got think a lot of yeah. run, he's he's got he a has lot. to end up getting all those things we talked about. And yeah. if this helps like him get there by trading that pick, he'll do it. I like yeah, that well, five-point plan. Down, yeah. It's really a four-point plan. That, that's how my, <laughs> good my math is. I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm saying, what's the fifth one? There is no fifth one. It's a four-point plan. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, no, the, we fifth, trade the, down. Fifth, the fifth point, though, is, Jim, they got to win. Yeah. 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 That would be the right. four points yeah. lead to winning. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So if, you got to win if games. Trade. If they trade down, though, in the first round, my pick would honestly be, especially if we trade Minnesota, I think you might have a couple of the bigger good skating defensemen there. Unless, if, again, you want to take a risk on Ivan Miroshenko, and I would be all for that because I'm obsessed with Ivan Miroshenko. So go ahead, go do it, Flyers. I won't complain. Everybody else will. But Owen Pickering would be, uh, just before, real quick, he would be him or Bixo if we trade to 24 just because yeah, they're like good skating guys, too, yeah. defensemen. I would kind of focus on them, and we have, Jim, one of those TV things that give you every channel from every country, so basically my whole life is watching a divorce, like I joke, like I probably won't get married for a while because I watch a divorce level amount of hockey, so if I do, it will last for about two weeks. And the, uh, so the, uh, <laughs> That's a lot but, of hockey. Uh, yeah, uh, be but... Too much, uh, Andy, you know, so, well, you know, there, Joe. Moderation. Yeah, Joe. Pickering yeah, yeah. is a, one of the more fun guys to watch because put plaster somebody and then make a good play in the offensive zone. So like watching and I, and I think a lot of people know, I do like kind of the old school mentality a little bit too. That's why Nathan McKinnon is probably one of the most fun superstars to watch because it beat the living mess out of somebody and then go score three goals on that same team within the same game. So that, that's still a facet I like a little bit. So I really like Pickering. Big still kind of um, started to impress me in overseas tournaments. If we trade down, I would kind of focus on we still need to build up our defense more in terms of a guy that's just big and touted in both ends, and I think those two could potentially be that. Again, like we said, this is a probability game, but you're picking kind of a necessity you need, which is big, good skaters that are more two-way, where it looks like Risto at this point is going to develop more into one way over time, but we'll have to see. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, this draft, in all likelihood, will not, unless – something like what we just talked about with the trade happens, it's probably not going to impact the 2022-23 no. uh, Flyers. So, um, and I know the organization is mostly concerned about 2022-23 right now. So, um, uh, you know, we can put a lot of stock in this. I think if they can use this pick to help next year's team, as they did the last one, they will, uh, or they tried. Um, and, you know, we'll see. I, I don't, it's not healthy for an organization that isn't at the top to go back to back years without a first round pick. Um, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, but if there's a draft not to have a first round pick as, as Steele was referring to, this might be it. Um, so, you know, next year you want your first round pick. And if you're in the lottery, you really want to win that lottery. Uh, but uh, yeah. so it's, it's just one of those things. I, 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 if they could take that fifth overall and put it in a package and it gets you a top line player right now, it, who's not like 32, um, I think they key do it. phrase. I key think phrase they do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. the guy, you know, Johnny's late twenties, but it, what's Fial? He's about twenty-seven. He's only like twenty-five or twenty-six. Is he really? You sure about that? He was in Nashville. Check, check on Fial. Yeah, there's um, the, the key phrase though. It might be twenty-seven. The key phrase is this: "There's a lot of this." If Kevin Fial was twenty-five, actually, he's only twenty-five. Really, we twenty-six, 26 next 25. season. Yeah, so be so you you have a lot of his prime years on us. Yeah, I mean he's uh, yeah. he's definitely. I mean he's got more prime years. You just you just put up five backwards, by the way. No, a lot it's of if five. If oh, it's still backwards though on the camera here. <laughs> it is all right. Well, yeah. I'm here, does this work? <laughs> but uh, but Sorry, anyway, uh, the it. the the guys um. I think now in our wrap up, we obviously have to get to. I think a big thing. We haven't even talked about the game. John Twitter. Yeah, exactly. Really? I think a big thing <laughs> John Twitter. To to. I think I'm a big thing John Tortorella <laughs> is uh, going to bring to the team is something one you're never going to see dump and chasing of one guy chasing it into the zone ever oh, again. Please, no. But the team coached by John Twitter. And two, 
I think the outlet passing is going to be – because you have defenseman Ronnie Adderd, who at college was very – now we'll see what he becomes at the NHL level at outlet passing. It's a different beast, obviously, but was good at that. York, we know, has that element to his game. Sanheim obviously really started to show last year, and obviously Ellis is very good at that. So in order to do that, you have to have support from your forwards in the neutral zone. One of the best things I think John Tortorella coaches in – is support of the forwards in the neutral zone to get into the attacking zone. So that's what I'm excited to see because that's been something that you'll be watching the Flyers the last few years ripping your hair out going, can somebody just stay in the damn neutral zone so they can get the puck? Like, why do you keep going to the blue line? You cool. know, you know, stay Jim battle. talked about it. Like, Jim touched on it before we even got to the show where there's, there's going to be some things that Tortorella is going to bring to this team that a lot of the fans per se are not necessarily going to be ready for because everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the the press conferences are going to be exciting, you know, and all that. But there's some things that Tortorella does that are very good. Okay. And he makes players accountable. Okay, and whether it's publicly, privately, whatever the case is, he lets you know what where you stand with him. And I think that that's exactly what this team needs is that accountability. And I also think that this team needs exactly what Joe was talking about as well, too. There is no. System. There's no rhyme or reason for why players are doing the things that they're doing and where they're playing and why they're doing it. You know what I mean? Like, Yo was basically just trying to get the players to play. There was no system. There was no rhyme or reason. I, I, I got to stop you. There was a system. Uh, the, the, the problem, I, I got I to tell you guys, they, we've been through a lot of coaches here lately. Yeah. There's a system with every one of them. At, right. at some point, the problem becomes – do these players follow a system? And okay. there are certain players on this team that are going to learn that you follow John Tortorella's system. Or that's what I was trying to get to. Play. Yeah, you that's don't That's what I was trying to get to. I mean, he's, he's And it also doesn't Gattier. matter how much you get paid. He scratched yeah. Cam Atkinson. He scratched yeah. those guys in Columbus. He scratched Brandy Dubinsky. He didn't like it very much. And he made, you know, let's say, but the bottom line is John Tortorella doesn't care if you like it. That's, what, that's what I was trying to get to. Yeah. So yeah. the system, I mean, all coaches have a system. But it's how you get your players to play the system. Or if, and to use your word, Ron, if yeah. you get them to use, or Phi, backwards, if you get to use, <laughs> if you get them to use that system, then uh, it, to play that system, then you're, you have a much higher chance of being successful. And Tortorella has done that for the most part. He does have a shelf life. He hates talking about that. All coaches do. Yep. Um, but the bottom line is, he, he got Columbus to overperform for several years. I mean, they swept that Tampa, this Tampa Bay team. This is something that Colorado might do, but they swept that that Tampa Bay team. They uh, they did some things where it was almost all on just commitment to what Joe was talking about, commitment to, to moving up the ice as a unit, commitment to blocking shots, which John Totorello teams are obviously noted for. Right. Um, and, but that's know, what I was talking about, yeah, though, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get though. to. I, I, don't want you to I, don't, I want to disparage all these coaches. I mean, there's no doubt Mike Yo had a system. Elaine Vino absolutely had a system. Oh, right. Scott uh, Gordon had a system. Dave Axtell had a system. But, you know, sometimes play these players it. weren't playing it. Yeah. Right. And, and those, there are some players on this team that have been here through almost all those coaches that they got to know that you got to play this system or you're not going to play. And there are a couple of players in this team that I have in mind that are going to have to, to, show the coach that they'll play a system and you know and that'll be a big key to the season there's no doubt about it but John Tortorella's been pretty successful at getting players to play it yeah that's what I was going to try to say though that's that's what I was Winsky Winsky, I would say Anthony who I had on yesterday to talk about some stuff he brought up Zach Rowinski and Rowinski kind of had his nooks and crannies I guess is a way to put it with John Tortorella but now is very thankful for what he developed him into. Otherwise, he might have been more offensive and never became what he is today as a more all-round right. talked about right. defenseman as being right. one of the best developing defensemen in the league. So It, it just doesn't I, that, always work, right? right? Because I, even with John, I don't think it worked with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Mm-mm. And so they had to trade him. I don't think it worked with the guy they traded him for but all the time. In fact, yeah. Monty, although last right. year he was better. Right. No, but I no, mean, no. It, so it's not going to work with everybody. But, uh, you know, right. for those well, players, Jim, I know Pierre-Luc. 
something Pirlo, who I know you've done a couple shows with Steve Pirlo, says if you look at the guys that Torch ends up trading, if he most of them are guys that he knows have superstar talents, but they just don't fully necessarily always necessarily either see it in themselves or play to the extent of getting out. And then if when do they get moved? Nine times out of ten, they don't. They they end up being exactly what he thought. So it actually kind of like even if it doesn't work out for his team, it's almost like Ryan Johansson isn't a true number one center. He's a good center, but not a true number one. That's kind of what John Tortorella thought about. I would assume thought about him and why he got PLD kind of didn't commit enough. You look at how much talent he has, but you got to be committed to it every eighty two games. You can't be committed to it sixty five of the eighty two. So I think from watching those seemed like. So I feel like uh, something I'm going to really like to see here is I feel like everybody that kind of – we kind of saw those kind of like we talked about with the Phillies for the last 10 years. It's the first time in a while you saw it with the Flyers that like spaced out into space looks on people's faces where like you just didn't – like everyone has a look of like what the hell is going on? Like what are we supposed to do to solve this? Where John Tortorella I think is kind of going to be what Rob Thompson all of a sudden has become for the Phillies where all of a sudden they're like, oh my God. Now I know what I was supposed to be doing for the last seven years. Like where, like all of a sudden, a light bulb ticks, which that's happened for a lot of players. Yeah, I, mean, I got to point out though, this team under Elaine Vino went from mid-November to mid-March in 1920, tied for second in the NHL. Most points, tied for second, best point record. In the NHL. So it, we we brush over these years like they've never been good. Um, the thing is. That team was a – if you fly, if somehow transport your back, it's, it's tough to do this because it was before the pandemic. So much has changed. But we were feeling pretty good about Ron Hextall's rebuild, even though he was gone. But his players were all on the rise. Uh, we were rolling. They weren't winning those games with great goaltending. Carter Hart was playing well, but they were allowing the fewest shots in the NHL during that time. In fact, they were at the very top of the league in shots allowed per game. Uh, exactly. That stretch. So – you know, it's not like the, the current group. And now it's not the current group anymore. Matt Niskanen was a part of that group, obviously. But Matt Niskanen was not that good. Come on. It wasn't like Matt Niskanen retired and the whole thing fell apart. There were other things going uh, at work here. And again, last year, I'll, I'll point a lot of it to the injuries. But I, I'll, I'll just say that it, it's it's so we, we talk about the last eight years. They just didn't have an idea where they're going. No, that's not true. There, there were, that was a good run. That's a four month stretch. That's not a streak. That's four months that they were tied for second in the NHL in points. And that main core was the group that came back the next year, minus Matt Niskanen, and got off to a decent start, not playing great, but they were right. winning. Games. And then it fell apart. COVID hit, fell apart, never never recovered. This year, uh, you know, they started, with, I believe, 9-3-3 three, and three this year, believe it or not. That's yeah, they started yeah, good. Yeah. Started 9-3-3, yeah. Three, three, yeah. Again, the, the, the eye candy wasn't great. It wasn't like the eye test wasn't great. They weren't out playing teams. Carter was playing great. Still, uh, still winning but, though. But they were nine three and three. And anyhow, and then you know it fell off the injuries. And then they actually, Mike Yo, um, after he finally ended the ten game winless streak, they went five zero oh, and two over the next seven games into the holiday break. Coming out of the holiday break on the West Coast, they get COVID. Broveroff, Giroux, everybody out. On top of the injuries, they go into another long winless streak. Never recover. They bailed and then started going with young players at that point, too. And, I mean, so uh, you, you got to look at every season for what it's worth. Just, just paint these blanket statements that they have not been any good for 10 years. No, they haven't gone They haven't gone past the second round in 10 years. That's a, a true fact. But, I mean, they, there, were, there was a pocket right there when the rebuild looked like it was good, even though Hexy wasn't here anymore. The players he drafted looked like they were all taking a step up. The veteran core was playing well. Carter was playing well. It was like. This is it. And then they come out of it. They sweep the round robin. They win the first round. Not playing great against Montreal, but still winning that series. And then even though they went seven with the Islanders, they won three in overtime. They, they just barely, you know, they got to seven games. But still, that team was a win away from the conference finals after being the best team in the league or tied to the second best in the league for a four-month stretch during the regular season. That was, that was just you know, one, two, three seasons ago now. But it wasn't that long ago. So it, it, it went that far south. It can certainly go that far north. I, I just it, it, we, we talk, and, and John Chodorov does not want to get into predicting, you know, 
what they're going to do next year. Will they be a, a contender? Uh, he shouldn't because he hasn't even coached the team yet. He doesn't really know. You don't know until you see these players every day. Oh, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, it could. They could be in the playoffs. He wasn't going to say no either. Uh, and so in hockey especially, coaching is huge. It, it, hockey and football, I'd say, are the two sports where coaching is just humongous. Basketball, it means something, but the players are really what drive it. Your yeah. top superstars. And, foot, uh, and, uh, and baseball, I think, is more – the, the players, the individual players. I mean, Rob Thompson's great, but this is this. I know Rob Thompson. He's a great guy, but this surge by the Phillies has more to do with the fact that they played a bunch of teams that were playing poorly and the Phillies were due to win. They aren't this bad. They weren't as bad as they were. On right. The show. Um, and I think they're going to settle back a little but but uh, I don't think in baseball, a manager can just push a button and the team takes off. It's, it's more right. about the players in hockey and football structure is so important. Yes. That, Coaching is just really, really important. And I Agreed. think they got the right guy in John Tortorella. Um, I, I think Barry Trotz would have been the right guy. I think a couple of other guys out there might have been the right guy, too. There's a healthy list of, of good coaches available out there. But John Tortorella was certainly one guy who I, I said right from the get-go. If they get Torts or Trotz, I'm not going to be upset. And then there were a couple of other guys out of that list I wouldn't have been upset with either. But certainly not Torts. I know him. I've known him a long time. Um, and uh, he cares about his players like a parent cares about their, their kids, but he does use tough love. Some players can handle it. Some can't. Well, you know, and so you I, have I to... just think that he is the right guy. Step one of the four step plan, I think has been achieved already. When, when yeah. you, when you have kids and the kids do wrong, what do you have to do to the kids? You have to chasten them, right? You, you have to discipline chasen. the kids. Yes. Chasing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You discipline your kids, right? You know? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm I didn't sorry. know for a second. <laughs> no, I'm not chasing them. You chain your kid. No, no, you're no, no, chasing. No. Chasing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Wait, we're always chasing our kids. Uh, right, yeah, exactly. Chasing. But yes. my point is this, though. I think that Tortorella coming in here is going to make this team accountable to his system. Yes, Mike Yo had a system, and yes, Vino had a system, and they all said the same thing, but they didn't really make the players accountable. You know, yes, they have to play a system because obviously you have to play a system in hockey. That's how it is, right? But what I'm trying to say is that, yes, the players didn't adhere to that system. But what Tortorella is going to do is if you don't adhere to his system, you're not going to be playing. Right. Yeah, it doesn't right? matter if you're Risto at $5 million. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, when, anybody when else at more. And you didn't play. adhere to a system. You, you kind of sat in the box a little bit and you were kind of in the doghouse. But but that was kind of you know I mean I'm here to tell you Tortorella is going to make guys accountable, okay? And that's that might be a little difficult for some of the folks here in well, Philadelphia to handle. I also think contrary to popular belief, with a lot of the stylistic play of our young guys that are coming up, he's actually going to be good for them because Ratcliffe's a big guy. I, I think agree. He's a bit of like Ratcliffe, Jim kind of brought that. Up. And also, if I forget to mention somebody, do not DM me. I did not. You're going to be good too. I just forgot to mention you. Hayden Hodgson, I think, will be good. I think he will make Brink kind of commit more to the other end with his size, too. Kind of like, I'm not saying, don't. he's not going to be Danny Breer. But like Danny Breer, 5A committed to both ends. He, nobody's going to be that good, though, necessarily at that size, at doing those things. But Tanner, I think, if he can stay healthy, that's the side of Tanner. He's well, I already saw him being good with the face-off dots. Check for John Tortorella loving you. And good on both ends already when healthy. Check for John Tortorella loving you part two. So him and Noah Cage, I think kind of go into that. And then the plethora of a bunch of other youngsters. Yes. A lot of our youngsters are kind of two-way. And John Tortorella likes two-way guys. Wyatt Wiley's the same way. And he talked about how Williams with the silver tips was a yeller a little bit. And he actually liked that style of coaching. So if there were defensive injuries and he gets a chance, Tortorella tends to have that kind of guy that nobody would expect on each team, too, that he tends to make pretty damn good, where I feel like him and Wyatt are definitely going to mesh well personality-wise, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's him, honestly. That's where, true. So I think he's a good guy that's going to really fit well. I think every, a lot of things, Brendan Manel, if he ever gets signed again and he develops and gets a chance, his personality definitely fits Twitter because he wants to – he stays in position but wants to rock you – as soon as you hit the line at 5'11", so he definitely doesn't play at 5'11 when you watch a Phantom game. As soon as you hit the blue line, he's Jacob Truba in <laughs> you. Yes, we're turning that into an adjective now. Into the uh, free world. So um, that's pretty much what he does. Well, go ahead, Steele. 
No, I was just going to say that I'm going to be very interested to see what he does for the goaltending as well, too. Everywhere that John Tortorella has been, the goaltending has gotten better. Although they say he's not that involved with the guy. I've listened to other No, 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 I understand that. But but when you play his system and you play the defense the way you're supposed to, goaltenders get better. I I, I firmly believe that Carter Hart's just a defensive structure away from being one of the top. Yes, yes. um, he if, really he hung in there really well last year, Carter, with the team not playing well. He did not hang in there the year before that, but I think he learned a lot from that season. And I think last year he hung in there toward the end. He started to slip, and then he, he got injured. But uh, yeah, a large part of the season, um, I was really happy to see how Carter was able to, to maintain his uh, his stability, even though the team was having trouble and was obviously all banged up, and there were a lot of minor league players in front of him at times. So um, yeah. it, it, it was. It was a um, a learning experience two years ago that I think he he, he learned. But now I think in, in order to take that next step, he needs to have a team playing well in front of him. And you know Vasilevsky is an amazing goalie, but you know the, the ridiculous record that Tampa Bay had in elimination games that they might not get a chance to uh, to <laughs> to, to I look think at they're it like eight and one or nine and one. Oh, but but also like they've allowed no goals and a lot of that yeah. Vasilevsky, but a lot of it's also they block everything fired his way. I mean, they just mm-hmm. commit. And that's how John Tortorella teams play. They commit to block shots. They You do that or you don't play. It's back to what you were saying, Steele. So, um, I think that will be very good for Carter Hart. I think he is good for goalies, but I think he's good for goalies because he's good for the defensive structure of the team. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. That's why I think with since him and Delba, I would just keep the goaltending coach and Delba and roll with getting new coaches for everybody else. If they have the relationship, apparently towards helps the goalies, like you said, by his structure. He's not. He's more hands off. Keep the guy that they already have a relationship with. Basically, would kind of be my stance on that at that point. But that's just my own opinion on that. When it comes to though young players, I also like the fact that we talked about the systematic Sandstrom. We don't know if he'll be back yet or not. I hope Felix Sandstrom's back because I've always liked Felix Sandstrom. But when it comes to Fedotov, we already know how good he was in Russia. Again, some of the rinks changed to NHL size in the K. A lot of them are still European size rinks. So he's got some experience playing in smaller rinks. Man, I'm he definitely about him. I am more big sound time excited about him than when he first came over. Because I know when he first came over, Jason said it too. He was kind of like all flappy all over the place when he was first here for his first like development camp and everything. Where now he's a lot more sound with his size. It's his first year though, so I also am going in with tempered expectations. I'm not coming into this going, "Oh my God, this guy's going to turn into the next Andre Vasilevsky in year one." Like that's just good. That's just unrealistic expectations, extraordinaire. So it's more. If I think Maybe. the realistic expectations for him were one B this year to Carter Hart, and then you kind of just have some Masterson, like you basically that's the Masterson, right? For the goal the goalies. I got that right, I think. That's I mixed up the award. No, the that's one that the team like the William combination Jennings? with William Jennings, yeah. Thank William you. Jennings, I mean, yeah, that's it. I mixed up the awards in my head too much. But any yeah, the Jennings that would give – I think if those two give you a good chance. Even Felix, I think, because if you re-sign Felix, I would let Ivan get some AHL time because he has to get used to North America. Yeah. That would be my – if you Felix at least had, what is it, 10 NHL games now or six? Something like something that. Something like that. Like something yeah. – six. Yeah, something like that. So it's not a big sample size, but if you're going to go young with your backup, I would at least go with the guy that's been in North America for a while that's already used to it. And then if – there's if Ivan's just killing the NHL, then you're obviously going to give him a chance. Unless if Sandy's murdering the NHL, then you kind of have a good problem to have there because it's never Probably. a problem to have too much of a goal. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think they're going to have to sign a veteran goalie, not necessarily to be the backup at the NHL level, um, but you can't have all kids. You can't have, <laughs> right? And, and Sandy's <laughs> not a kid anymore, but he's a kid in terms of his NHL experience. So if you go with Fedotov, Sandstrom, Urson as your Three goalies, let's say you're back up at the NHL level and you're two in the fans, that's a big risk. If Carter goes down, you got nobody with experience to lean on. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they sign not a Martin Jones kind of backup, but more like a guy who would play with the Phantoms as the backup. Almost um, like a Louis Domingue kind of. Domingue kind of guy. Um, oh, okay, I got you. Been these guys over the years and they've ended up stepping up uh, and, and ended up playing and they played that's quite well. That's why he's Louis Domingue. Because he stepped yeah, up this yeah, year and played for Pittsburgh. sure this year, the Hamburglar, uh, guys like that. Yeah. They, they just the guys that 
they're not, you know, they're not necessarily going to play at the NHL. They might not play at all at the NHL level. If everything's right, they won't. But if Kyron goes down, you're not going to want to have two guys with less than 10 games experience as your goalies. So um, I think right. I wouldn't be surprised if they sign a veteran. Uh, again, not to be the backup of the NHL level, but to be uh, with the minor league system. Gotcha, gotcha. That would make sense to me. I know a guy that already has experience with the Phantoms. I believe he's a free agent in Buffalo, didn't sign him. He already has experience with the organization. Tokarski, I think, is a free agent. Yeah, and he's been there so, before. Yeah, he's been they, with the they, Phantoms they before. Made, yeah, 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 he's he got some experience. So he, he would be one of those guys, yeah. But I think we kind of, as Pirlo would like to say, we're at a full 105, 42, but we'll go with our full 42. And actually, um, we babbled for 20 minutes before we even started the podcast. But that's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Father, what you're talking about? But, but Tim, if you had anything you wanted to share out for anything you're doing in the offseason, I'll turn it over to, uh, to you if you have any closing thoughts I'm or anything. I'm doing the broadcast coaching, which you guys have both uh, partaken in, and um, it's going really well. Um, I'm completely free, so... Not doing camps this year, per se. We're doing the one-on-ones, which I really like. So jimjacksonbroadcasting.com is my website. It's in, uh, it, it's out there, but it's being reconstructed, I guess is the best way to put it. But you can go there and get all the information um, on the, the broadcast coaching. Still doing audiobook narration, cameo, all that stuff, too. But mainly relaxing and looking forward to all the moves that the uh, – the Flyers are going to make here, and they've started with one good move, I think, already with the coach, and we'll see where they go after the draft. The draft's a big, big decision, too, and then free agency and trades. So I, I think it's going to be a um, an offseason of, uh, of action. So I look forward to it. Yeah, I do, too. And then, Steele, what do you have as a closing thought or anything to share out? Uh, I think that this is going to open some eyes in Philadelphia hiring this coach. Um, I think people should be um, prepared to see some of the truth being touted by this particular coach. I think that's what's going to happen here. Um, I think that's going to probably be a good thing for Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, I am too also very interested to see how things go in the offseason with the draft and how that progresses and how they move and how they do their offseason moves. Because let's face it, this is Chuck's last swing. I mean, Most if, likely. Yeah. if if he doesn't, if he, if this doesn't knock it out of the park, this off season, I think, then I think somebody is going to be on the hot seat for next year because here we are. Well, now. I, I wouldn't say it's to knock it out of the park. He just has to get them into playoff relevance. You're not going to be able to control whether you make the playoffs again. If they get all banged up again, still, they're not making the playoffs. Like, well, okay. Is out I got you. I understand. We saw that with Vegas too. Right. I no, I understand. Vegas I understand. I'm not trying to look. I'm not trying to say that the injuries are Chuck's fault. I'm not saying that at all. Okay. But what I'm saying is, is that he needs to make some moves to make this team relevant in a much quicker way than what he has. And I think that. I think he's on the hot seat as far as I'm concerned. In my opinion, if oh, things not, don't go well, right. If things don't go well this offseason. He's already on the hot seat. You don't miss the playoffs two years in a row after not having done that since 1993. And not being on the hot seat. But I also know that upper management thinks a lot of him. Yep. So that if this year derails because the same guys are out and then more guys are out or whatever, then there may be some consideration there. But the bottom line is uh, he has to put them in a position where we're going into the season although we were kind of there last year. You guys might not think we were, but we were thinking this is going to be a pretty good year. Um, I mean, yeah. Long I have to be know, yeah, yeah, going to season last year. That's awesome. Ryan Ellis is yeah. good. Back yeah. It's a good off season for Chuck. And then all the injuries happened and it wasn't a good off season anymore. So um, we'll see. We'll see where we're at. But, you know, he knows he's on the hot seat. I think most GMs, quite frankly, are in the hot seat. <laughs> if, if you uh, – have a really bad year, you're you're on the hot seat. Pretty it's much, just, that's and for a coach as well. Yeah. Um, but um, but I think he's done done well with his first uh, move of the summer, and um, I think uh, I think it'll be interested to see. I, I think it'll be an interesting summer. I don't think it's going to be one of like completely overhauling the roster, but right. I think there are going to be some some changes. Um, Can't and do then, it all one season off season. You have to you're going to have to space it out. Well, yeah. it's you have salary cap issues. So that's what I mean. Almost every team is more to the point. That's the bigger problem. Yeah. Almost every team is up against the cap. So 
Um, you can you find a couple of them that aren't and maybe make some deals. But uh, uh, it, it's uh, he's an experienced general manager. I know he gets tons of criticism because they've missed the playoffs two years in a row. But um, uh, again, there's no GM of any team that's making the playoffs with the injuries that the Flyers had last year. Uh, the only team that's comparable is Pittsburgh. They somehow lose Crosby, Malkin for long periods of time, sometimes Latang, not necessarily last year. but And, um, you know, they have injuries to their goalies and they have other injuries and they somehow still win. <laughs> yeah. um, and some of that is when Crosby comes back, he just picks that team up. I mean, carries. Vegas kind of did the same thing this year, too. They lost a lot of man games, and they still were fighting for the playoffs at the end. I mean, they didn't yeah, make they, it, but... They they fell right off. They, they, they did, did. They that, did. They went but, from Stanley Cup favorites of, from some to out of the playoffs. No, I, I understand. Yeah, I expected more from Vegas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Had high and expectations they they for the decimated. Flyers this past year, too. They were decimated. You know. I mean, uh, the Vegas, but, you know... and. They've gone. They've gone after it more than the Flyers have. I mean, they've gone after it every year. So, you know, when does their GM be on the hot seat? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean. So, I mean, my, my for me, I think my final wrap up. You guys said oh, a lot of them, but I think the biggest thing is, I my biggest excited thing. We didn't really talk about on podcast. We talked about more before the podcast is Tortorella. Only weakness I would say that you could really point to is his power plays. When you go back and look at teams, are not always the sexiest. Where now that he said, I want to commit to having a pure power play coach, now everything falls into place of all the benefits we talked about that you get with John Twitterell throughout the show with the great penalty kill, the great shot blocking defense, which means I should have also threw Linus Hogberg into that equation because he's a shot blocking, good shot blocker. When I mentioned guys that he might benefit of from Twitterella. Uh, but the, I think that's what I'm really excited uh, to see, not just the whole accountability stuff, but the fact that Tortorella, I think a lot of people have, from listening to different podcasts said this, he seems to have realized his weaknesses more with age. And I think that's a huge benefit for him even being, he already has been like a Hall of Fame level coach. So imagine a guy that's already been that good now realizing the one thing that's kept him from being the ultimate great, which is probably why I think I'm really excited to see what he can do here, because now that he realized he needs that offensive sleuth, I think that's the only thing he really needed to do. Yeah. So now that he did do that, it's going to be really interesting to see what it all comes together, because you have Limblum, you have some players that I think have the ability to be good in front of the net to do those Braden Shen one-timer things, whether you set it up from the other side and then do it to Tibbet in the middle from the other side. It's not like you have to do it from with a lefty. So I think there's different options there, and I feel like he's going to get a coach that's really going to be able to kind of look at things and see that as like a roadmap, like kind of like Noble. That's why I wouldn't be opposed if we can get him back from Hartford, do being the power play coach, because McDavid always talked about how he would just roadmap everything for you like it was easy as heck, and you wouldn't even have to think about it because of how easy he made it. So I feel like somebody like that or somebody at least in that coaching style, that would kind of be my closing point, and then you just have a perfect blend of the two, basically. Awesome but, sauce, man. But yeah, we thank everybody for joining us. This has been uh, the latest edition of really the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Cast because we didn't just talk about the Flyers. The Flyers, I would just call <laughs> grittiest take, but we talked we about pretty much every other thing. Yeah, and then got to talking about the Flyers. So this was more the Sports Fanatic News overall hockey cast. And um, we thank you all for joining us. Please continue to subscribe. Stay safe out there, everybody, and enjoy the Stanley Cup. And pretty soon, enjoy the great off season and your summer vacations. Peace out, everybody.